Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 754. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is August 16th, 2022. You know, there's nothing like practice. And today, I think you and I have practiced the intro to Anglican Unscripted five, maybe six times. It's, it's one of those days. It's not that we don't know what we're doing. It's that we have lots of interruptions going on today. Uh, telephone calls, no big deal. And, you know, this and that. You had to go do husbandly duties and uh, pick your wife up from the, the uh, hairdresser. I've had to take phone calls. It's just one of those days. So this may be the take that we get to go the whole episode through. We'll have to see. But I want the audience to know that not every time we sit down and, and click the record button do we have the magic that we need, time, <laughs> uninterrupted time, to conduct a wonderful show. I hope this one works, George. We'll have to see. First, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Uh, slow time of year here in Florida. The snowbirds are away. And... Uh, the tourists aren't here, so it allows me to sort of get home early in the in the week afternoon. And I've been spreading manure around the garden now that I'm a homeowner, and uh, cool. we have plenty of cow and and horse manure in the county. The variety of place. manure, yes. <laughs> and I don't have to pay for it; I just have to pick it up. And uh, so, we, come well, this uh, you, fall, you don't just drive over to the farm and, and open up the trunk and say, "Load it in." No, no, no. I have a trailer okay. with uh, some uh, green uh, plastic trash bags. Uh, okay. But come spring, the uh, azaleas and the rhododendrons and the bougainvilleas will be beautiful, uh, courtesy of our local horses and cattle and uh, sheep and goats. Not pigs. That stinks worse no, than others. But, uh, that's right. Well, it, what, a, what a creative statement, because uh, out of chaos comes creation, and creation needs manure to grow. So, wow. I happen to be a bachelor this week as Jill is taking a business trip over to Maryland and uh, she's getting back into the, the travel stuff and this is her first trip since COVID uh, for business and th things are starting to open up. Even though today Jill Biden uh, announced that she has COVID, I think COVID is so less serious with the, the current strains that uh, the world's starting to op open up more and more. You know, clearly you travel a lot, but uh, to do a business trip on a plane is a lot of risk for a company to do now, and they're still they're starting to, to take that little uh, step into the into the post COVID times. George, Kevin, I want to change. We've been practicing all morning, all afternoon, and I want to just change up things a bit. Sure. And start with a good news story instead of the list of bad news stories. Hold on, where where's the good on the on the uh, list here? One, the two, good three, four. The good comes in the reaction and response of Justin Welby to the assault on Salman Rushdie. Okay. I think, as, as the world knows, Salman Rushdie was at a Methodist summer camp at Chautauqua on the banks of, uh, on the shores of Lake Erie. It's a big uh, annual thing where people come and listen to deep conversations from serious thinkers and whatnot every summer. And a 24 year old man from New Jersey, who was an immigrant from Lebanon and is a Shia Muslim, attacked Rushdie, stabbed him 14 times. He was on a ventilator. He should lose an eye, but he should make it. Justin Welby, unlike other leaders, uh, including our own U.S. government, was, as soon as this news broke, was forthright in his condemnation of the attack and defending free speech. Mm -hmm. uh, the U.S. Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, went for 48 hours and even gave a press conference on relations with Iran and said nothing about Salman Rushdie, while Justin Welby, Welby defended free speech, both in that case and in the subsequent case in the UK where J.K. Rowling, the author of the Harry Potter books, published uh, uh, on Twitter a supporting uh, you know, word for Salman Rushdie, and she immediately was besieged by Islamic fundamentalists who said, you're next, you're going to be yeah. killed. And Justin Welby did the right thing and stood up for free speech, free unfettered speech, and condemned this these attacks. 
well, verbal George, attacks and physical attack. Here in America, <laughs> our hands are tied. Uh, if you remember, uh, Trump canceled the contract with uh, Iran, the, the Iranian nuclear deal that was set up by Obama. And so we're currently, over the last two years, renegotiating that. Uh, we're going to give them $275 billion in credits uh, towards this new contract we have for their their nuclear weapons procurement and, and, and design. And uh, in a such, we're not going to say anything especially when they're so heavily involved in the attack and uh, fatwa on Sam and Rushdie, that I would not be surprised if some people in the government are happy about this, George. Yeah. Well, the FBI just arrested another man who was uh, basically sent by Iran to murder uh, uh, former Secretary of State Pompeo mm -hmm. and uh, John Bolton, the former... Uh, uh, advisor to President Trump on uh, uh, foreign relations, foreign affairs advisor. You know, Iran has uh, been, if anything, and emboldened by our government stance towards it, so that they feel they can go to a Methodist summer camp and try to murder Justin, not Justin, uh, try to murder Salman Rushdie. Yeah. You know, thirty odd years after the Satanic Verses were published. Um, I don't know. It's interesting. We're in a time now where we've lived under a, a quasi folk fatwa, woke fatwa, uh, towards conservatives for you know three, four years, where you can be canceled if you say some the wrong thing in public from your job, where you can be canceled from the airwaves and Twitter and Facebook for posting something that would offend somebody, and I think that fatwa, the woke fatwa, certainly empowers the Iranian fatwa. And two things I want to point out. One, uh, Joan, Joan Campbell Brown, uh, Joan Brown Campbell, the former head of the National Council of Churches, a really super duper woke liberal, is now head of programming at the Ch Chautauqua. And one of the things she told Salman Rushdie is, uh, you cannot criticize Islam. So even Rushdie was put on a sort of a uh, woke, uh, woke uh, leash and uh it's i wonder could sam and rushdie publish the satanic verses today oh, no, absolutely. would any of the major publishing houses even pick up the book well okay uh, I, between the two of us i've read it i've read satanic verses and the offending paragraphs were contained in a dream of one of the characters uh, did you ever get a chance to read it no, I never did. It's not uh, that good of a book. I don't think it's worth dying for. Uh, but uh, the point here is there are nations, uh, especially uh, some Orthodox Islamic nations, who take the insultation of uh, uh, Muhammad as something that they can uh, respond to violently. Iran is mm -hmm. one of them. Iraq is one of them and it's the former iraq is one of them it's interesting to see that they're still allowed to do that in today's world the only uh religion that can be successfully criticized is christianity mm. yeah. well the who would have thought that 30 years later the people calling for censorship would have have won because that's essentially what's happened with the woke culture, the cancel culture. Mm -hmm. Those people pushing the uh, Salman Rushdie cannot print this book. He cannot say these things. You know, remember the Charlie Hebdo cartoons and the massacre at the office there. All the things that, all the, the uh, murder of the Dutch filmmaker Theo Van Gogh. Van Gogh? Van Gogh. Um, Van this stuff is never ending. This stuff is not ending. And you would have thought at a certain time the world would wake up to the danger that is being promulgated by these deluded people. I want to offer you a bit of hope. And you guys want to talk about Unscripted. We've recorded five or six uh, half episodes today. We've never talked about this yet. This is the first time this has come up. So we're going to stick with the answer. It's fresh. <laughs> it's so fresh. <laughs> you would. And you could, we, you recorded basically the attempted assassination of Salman Rushdie as a good news story. 
but that, that's so unscripted. Justin Welby, Justin Response. Welby being <laughs> responsible adult, okay. following the attempted assassination of Trump. Otherwise, we only have bad news. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> well, here, here's some good news. Um, the trending um, hashtag uh, LGP LGB drop the T is uh, trending now for the last couple of days on Twitter and Facebook as the LGB community is finally saying, we did all this hard work by ourselves. We, the, the T was never involved, the, the trans community, and th they're taking a free ride on all the hard work and T changes the LGB and we're sick and tired of it. And so we want to have from this day forward, and this is very high up in the LGBT, formerly T community, they're, they're, they're dropping the T, George. That's major news. You're not going to see CBS report it, ABC report it, NBC report it, Fox News, CNBC. That's Anglican Unscripted is reporting. There's now a big breakup going on within the LGBTQ community. There's another one that wants to drop the Q. Um, and it, I'm just going through all these tweets on, on, on Facebook and Twitter and watching this, this brewing feud that's always been there. But in order to uh, propagate their own success, they had to support the T, which they never wanted to support the T. And if you guys have Twitter, just uh, I'll, I'll put the hash link in, in, the, in the show notes. And uh, the first 15 articles admit, okay, there's a slippery slope. We knew there would be a slippery slope. The slippery slope is, is here, and it's very slippery. If you've been watching closely the news, you may have had hints of this because Martina Navratilovna, the tennis superstar of the yeah. 1980s, uh, was probably, to my memory, one of the first out lesbian athletes. Sports and stars, absolutely. Sports, yeah. sports stars. Um, mm -hmm. Billie Jean King as well, but I think mm -hmm. Martina's been you know, up there also. And she has been canceled the past few years because she is vociferous in saying, uh, transgendered women or men who were once men and are now identifying as women should not compete in women's sports because of their biological advantages by having gone through puberty. And because of that, she's lost endorsements. She's been asked to step away from leadership in the U.S., you know, in the World Tennis Federation. Uh, J.K. Rowling has been subject to cancel culture mm -hmm. because she, you know, uh, Essentially, there's a clash between feminism and the transgender movement, and the woke culture says that the transgender movement trumps feminism. And there's some people like Mar Martina, like J.K. Rowling, who are saying, no, we did not fight these fights just to have uh, the woman of the year in uh, for t Time Nobody, Magazine yeah, be, yeah. Be, a, be a man yeah. wearing a dress. The lesbians are fighting the T's, the, the uh, uh, homosexual men are fighting the Q's. It's, it's, I, it's not fun to watch, but it's one of those interesting things uh, going on right now in social media, Twitter and Facebook. Um, well, Kevin, there's not so much new in this world because this is like the French Revolution where the, eventually the, the, the revolutionaries got around to, to beheading Robespierre. The revolution eats their own. And uh, maybe we're just seeing that final portion of the revolutionary fervor devouring uh, the craziest elements of it. Yeah. I hope so. I don't know. I just want to put this little screenshot up. They've changed the, ro the, the rainbow flag into a war flag. You know, it, it, it's so... I support dropping the T from LG, uh, LGB. They are not the same. Many young gay people are being drawn into a social and medical transition because of the saturation of deliberate and passive TRA ally activism. And this is from Mama of Lesbian, a very famous, prominent uh, Twitter uh, uh, person out there. And I, I don't subscribe to her feed, Kevin, so I can't tell you. <laughs> it just, I can. Uh, I, I, I follow this stuff and because uh, you know and love thy enemy, so to speak. So, all right, that's enough for story one. 
Now you, you took me completely off in an unscripted area. I have to go back to the notes. Corruption, corruption. Yeah, it's what it's it's in the middle of August. We should be doing garden stories. Uh, let's go quickly. One more good news story. I've been we'll talking about manure all morning, Kevin. So I mean, we've done the garden, but uh... I I hope our listeners and viewers are patient today. Let's let's go. Let's skip the uh, a couple of the corruption stories. We will do the Christopher Wells story. Then we will uh, slam all the corruption stuff into the back of the show. Now we have to say up front, Christopher Wells uh, was a uh, Living Church was a customer of mine. So I got I got to let that bias go out there that I am biased on the story and I, I I love Christopher Wells and I love Living Church. They're kind of a competition in a, in a periodical long format of uh, Anglican Inc. and Anglican, uh, just Anglican Dead Inc. So just got to put that out there. We're, we're reporting on the competition, but a friend to the program and a friend to Kevin. And George, you know Christopher too. Yes, from 2003 to 2012, I wrote, I was a correspondent okay. for the Living Church. And when Christopher was appointed editor, he let go Steve Waring, the news editor, and uh, I fall, I was let go as well. Okay, so th there's our biases up front. Uh, so what's the news on Christopher Wells, George? He has been appointed to lead the uh, Anglican Consultative Council's uh, Commission on Unity, Faith, and Order. And this is a bit surprising because Wells is no bleeding heart liberal. Uh, he. Uh, um, he's a corporate man. He's a corporatist. He's a company man. Mm -hmm. He he follows the Welby line of church unity being paramount, but he is not into the cuckoo stuff. And so here's an American that the liberals see as conservative appointed to a major role within the Anglican communion. So that's a notable, notable shift out of yeah. the ACC and uh, Justin Welby. I did an interview with Christopher Wells, and no, I can't find it, uh, back at the Episcopal Church's General Convention in Columbus. Was that 2009? Six? Nine or six? Uh, six, six. Six, yeah. Six, six, six. Uh, that's the one where I, uh, Catherine Jefford Shroy was. Catherine Jefford, yeah. Okay. And so, great, very conservative. He has all the right answers on uh, the hot topics, but he's obviously an institutionalist. And his explanation of being an institutionalist made sense. You know, he he could he could defend it better than Justin ever could. Uh, certainly better than any uh, uh, Episcopal House of Bishops uh, could have done it. So, yeah, it, it is what it is. I do find interest in this appointment as well, and hope that it benefits the communion in a good way, George. All right, now all the corruption stories. Uh, Page one or page two? <laughs> we'll start with one. Uh, Scottish bishop who was appointed to a conservative diocese. She was liberal. I think she was uh, appointed to make sure that uh, diocese eventually goes liberal. Uh, lost her job. Well, she didn't lose her job. She was brought up on charges and uh, she, uh, forced to step down. She appealed that and is now back in the game. And we need to talk about that. This is kind of crazy. I didn't know you could appeal a uh, suspension and, and be brought right back on, George. The story really, you know, Anne Dyer, Bishop of Aberdeen and Orkney, is the uh, subject of the story. But the real message to the story is the gross incompetence of the College of Bishops of the Scottish Episcopal Church. Uh, we've talked about Bishop Dyer in the past, how she was appointed to the position, a liberal to the conservative Scottish diocese. She alienated most of, if not all, the clergy. She went through various forms of investigations that recommended that she be canned. And each time the Scottish bishops came back saying, give it another chance. Well, we'll, we'll take this under advisement. Now, their hand was forced recently when two formal complaints of misconduct were filed. But they held them off so that she could attend the Lambeth Conference. Then when she get, they all get home from the Lambeth Conference, come back into office, uh, last Wednesday, the Primus, Mark Strange, the man who sort of engineered her appointment, and the appointment of the first uh, out gay, non-celibate homosexual bishop in the Scottish Episcopal Church, the Bishop of Brecon, um, he announces that uh, she's been suspended pending her uh, trial for misconduct. 
Well, late that later that night, I got an email from the general secretary of the Scottish Episcopal Church, uh, saying you need to update your story, and he gave me a link to a news statement where, because she had appealed, she was unsuspended. Now, the Times of London this morning uh, ran sort of the reaction story, where people are basically outraged because it doesn't say that you can be unsuspended if you appeal. It, this. In other words, there's one rule for the bishops and one rule for everybody else. The Scottish Episcopal Church rules runs on sort of a job for the boys and girls who are friends of the inner circle. Whatever they do, they'll be covered. Whatever ill, you know, it really leaves a stink in the mouth. And they're like Kevin Holdsworthy, Kelvin Holdsworthy, who was the dean of Glasgow Cathedral. He's a prominent gay activist. Even he is sounding out saying, hey, this just doesn't pass the smell test and it's it's i it's symbolic of the decline of the scottish episcopal church that their bishops are more preoccupied with protecting the their club and their own than rather seeing justice and truth prevail well i think we've seen wherever there are virtue signaling bishops that the church is faltering and failing uh, certainly over here in America, in Canada, uh, portions of Europe, especially the, the Scottish Church. And it's hard to watch from afar because Anglican Unscripted would not exist if bishops held to the rules, if bishops acted like bishops mm -hmm. should, if bishops held to the canons, if bishops held accountability amongst each other and also with their clergy. We, I, we would have we, we completely out of a job. I could not sit down here on a Tuesday or a Friday and, and report anything except do gardens and maybe an update to a prayer book every a decade or so. And because the church is so broken at the Episcopate level, I'm not surprised about what we're reading in Scotland. And I suspect it's going to get much worse because they're going to be afraid to susp suspend her after the appeal now. She may threaten lawsuits. Yeah, and, and we're not talking about her just being mildly unpleasant person to work with. The yeah. stories that are coming out are that there was one uh, a woman who was so bullied by Bishop Dyer that uh, she was contemplating suicide. The one non-white, uh, he was an Asian priest, uh, Indian ancestry, in the diocese was forced from his job because she wanted to consolidate power and he was the cathedral dean and you know get political games were played and out he goes um these are major charges of ruining people's careers ruining people's lives driving them to the point of suicide um and when you have a church where this is the news that is being reported not lives changed not growth not excitement not evangelism but the bishops gathering around to protect one of their own one more time. It speaks of essentially the failure of an institution, an institution that really needs to be scrapped and, and rebuilt from ground up. Absolutely. Ah, good. We got that out of our. We got that out of our system, George. We don't have to talk about any other bishops the rest of the show. Except, except for the rest of the stories. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, let's move on to the Diocese of London. We've been reporting uh, all spring and summer about an investigation that's been going on over there into a person treasurer who worked for the Diocese of London. I got that right, right? Yeah. Who embezzled money. Not the first one ever in the Anglican communion to embezzle money, but he got a sizable amount uh, uh, moved from the diocese coffers into his coffers so that he could go out and gamble, George. Let's talk about this. Martin Sargent, for over 10 years, was the director of finance and plant, the physical assets. And he appeared uh, two Fridays ago at the Westminster Magistrate's Office to answer charges of stealing approximately 6.3 million US dollars. It's actually it was in British pounds, but I'm, I'm converting That's the right. currency. We do that. And I think he now holds the record for theft. Um, uh, there is, of course, the Episcopal Church precedent uh, yes. <laughs> 20, 30 well, years ago. And maybe with inflation, he tops off uh, the, the cook, uh, the treasurer of the Episcopal Church that thefts. But um, Martin Sargent is 
ran the Two Cities Trust and that dispersed money to the historic and ancient churches in the city of London. Uh, because no people live in the city of London anymore, the churches mainly function during the week or essentially as tourists' uh, spots. And if they need money to fix a roof, or they need money for organ repair, they apply to the trust and they, uh, the trust makes a grant and it's dispersed. Well, Sargent uh, is alleged to have created false grant requests or sort of doubling grant requests and siphoning money off. And he was a good enough accountant to basically get away for that, get away with this for 10 years. And at the uh, magistrate's hearing, the uh, Crown Prosecution Service said that he had he was recorded as having made 180 flights on British Airways to go on gambling junkets during the time he was uh, allegedly stealing the money. And because he was gambling, there's no recourse that he, it's not like he socked it away in Switzerland or under his under his bed. It's, it's non recoverable gone. funds. And this is, you know, he knew he was getting caught eventually. I mean, as well as you hide this type of thing, highs like gambling and other addictions uh, just lead the brain to, I'm going to do it anyway so I can go and get the gambling high. And at some point, his brain said, uh, it's worth the risk. And you find that so much in addiction type uh, issues with within the church, George. Uh, I, remember, I don't remember what the... Uh, secretary took in the Episcopal Church. She got two point three million, but what was her? Was she a horse trader or something? I forget what she did. No, I think she was paying for things like children's private school, living, like that, yeah, buying buying a house in a nice suburb of New York City. She was she was a they were actually able to get money out of her. Mm -hmm. uh, the insurance insurance company pays for the loss, then they go after the thief. And they were able to get uh, some recovery, forcing them to sell their house and everything. Are they going to have a, a recovery from an insurance here as well, George, in London? Well, I'm sure they are recover. Uh, will uh, will, but I don't know if it pays all of it. But uh... all right, let's talk about property losses. There was a huge... well, one one thing. Just okay. one thing. Uh, sure. We we talked about the suicide of Alan Griffin. Yes, yeah, it's, uh, it's related. Uh, yeah. Alan Griffin was the priest who in November 2020 committed suicide. He was a Diocese of London priest who retired. And evidently a campaign was started within the Church of England, within the Diocese of London that accused him of being a pedophile. He was a gay man, but he was not a pedophile. And one of the things that the report found was that the whole sort of lie started when Martin Sargent retired and mentioned in his exit interviews we should look into alan griffin so the thief starts a lie that led to this poor priest taking his life um it's just sad sick world it is and that's why you and i have this show to be transparent about the church not that people would lose faith in the church but that you would know the whole story all right Let's move on here to property damage within the church. Cuba and Cairo. Let's start with Cuba, George. Two weeks ago, I think it was August 5th or 6th, uh, tropical, there was lightning in a tropical storm. Kevin, you wouldn't know what that's like what's, living in Florida. That? <laughs> it was at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, Boom. just like here. Yeah. And lightning struck an oil storage tanker in the western Cuban city of Matanzas. And the Cubans don't have the safety features that uh, we have in the United States and other advanced countries. And a massive fire began that has is still burning, that has destroyed half of Cuba's oil reserves. And the Bishop of Cuba, Griselda del Campo, uh, Griselda Delgado del Campo, has put out a pastoral letter because a number of people have been killed, firefighters have been killed, and. Cuba right now, even before this, you know, runs on uh, blackouts. In other words, they, the government will say, okay, no electric today from this time to that time. Before half of its oil reserves, which turn the turbines, fuel the turbines that create Cuba's electricity. And they so also Cuba, fuel all those 1955 uh, Chevys they drive around, George. 
So Cuba, which has been in a pretty bad state economically for a long time, they don't have the Russians anymore to support them, and the Venezuelans uh, may want to support them, but they may not. Uh, but Cuba is going to be in a bad position and without without oil the uh, factories don't work uh the the farms don't have uh diesel to fuel the tractors to plow the fields to to harvest the sugarcane and cotton to basically cuba uh bishop delgado is uh, said is basically facing not only economic privation but could see starvation oh absolutely yeah, because yeah. of this natural disaster communism runs on energy uh it used to run on just uh putting the man into the field and, and working to death but you know once energy and technology and, and mechanics took over the farmland uh it runs on energy and it's going to be very difficult to watch what happens because communism is a two-class system the haves mm -hmm. and the haves nots the animal farms and you're going to see the average what you would call middle class worker in uh, Cuba starving and they don't have a lot of meat on their bones to start with George it's not mm -hmm. a great civilization let's talk uh, we covered that one because somehow you started with story four first then you went to story one we got two taken care of I'm going here did we talk about Justin Welby's unscripted moments George no we didn't but let's, let's do, do Cairo okay let's do Cairo yep let's Cairo, Cairo. Uh, another natural disaster. This past Sunday, there was an electrical fire at a Coptic Orthodox church in Cairo. There are over a thousand people worshiping in the church at the time. And above the front entrance is where they had all the electrical wires coming in to run the air conditioners. And they caught on fire. And the fire spread down to the front and it caused a panic. And 41 people died. Most of them were trampled to death. Others died of smoke inhalation at this Coptic Orthodox Church. And Sami Shahata, the uh, uh, Anglican Archbishop of Alexandria and the Bishop of Egypt, has put out a statement of condolence to uh, the Coptic Orthodox Patriarch uh, Tawedros, or Theodore in English. Um, the, the Coptics, the Christians in Egypt just can't seem to get a break. Either we've got Muslim extremists storming their churches, shooting up the place, or we have uh, people just going to a regular Sunday service and the AC breaks down and they get trampled to death because they don't have you know adequate uh, egress and uh, exits uh, in case of fire. It's just, yeah. it, and the thing is, I've been, uh, you and I have been to some African churches where I could see that happening. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Or just the slightest earthquake. Yeah, you're going to mm -hmm. lose some of these wonderful structures. And, you know, in our travels, uh, there's, I guarantee this church, you know, doesn't have insurance. You know, it, oh, it's no. One, no, this is one of those places where, you know, keep uh, the church in your prayers. All right, George, let's move on to Moale, where rumors are, and it's just a rumor, unless you can correct me in here, um, the diocese wants to pay off the bishop so he will leave office for the sum of one million dollars i would leave i would leave office for a million dollars george let, let, what's the story here malawi 24 a news source in malawi is reporting that uh brighton malasa the bishop of upper shire has been offered a million dollar severance package to leave he's 46 years old uh, bishop uh, malasa and He's had trouble in his diocese from, uh, for a long time now. Um, in 2019, 37 of 41 parishes met and called for him to resign. And it is alleged that he has uh, basically been stealing from the diocese, uh, pointing his buddies to uh, positions in church schools and hospitals, and that he has, uh, he's guilty of moral turpitude. He has children out of wedlock uh, with women in the diocese. Well, the bishops of Central Africa hired an auditor to look into the financial side. And the audit was given back to the bishops who earlier this year, I think it was January, said, uh, Brighton, we'd like you to resign and you can go at the end of June 2022. And uh, the bishop responded, well, 
The canons say that if I resign at the age of 46, I still have to be paid until I turn 65. So I'll resign if you give me my salary, housing, and auto allowance for the next 19 years. Well, the Diocese of Upper Shire can't afford to pay him his costs as well as have another bishop, so there was an impasse. And so Bishop Brighton went off to the Lambeth Conference because he hadn't resigned and the province hadn't made him. Yeah. Well, today it was announced in the papers that uh, a deal had been reached. And I published the pre the uh, you know, newspaper reports say this. Well, we got a we got a quick we got a quick email from a uh, uh, provincial uh, source that said, "Whoa, whoa, 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 whoa! We don't have a million bucks to pay off this guy, and the prop diocese certainly doesn't have a million. Somebody's fed you a line here. This is what he wants. That's, that's We've right. not agreed to this." <laughs> So yeah, well, I wonder who wrote that press example. <laughs> We've got a fascinating example of how fake news operates. Mm -hmm. That, you know, somebody gave a story that pushes paying off Bishop Brighton now to the press and saying the deal had been struck. And it hadn't been struck. And now it sort of either forces, you know, it, it forces the hand of either drop proceedings against the bishop or come up with the cash. So somebody's been playing games here. I don't know who it is. I don't either, but here, if you think about it, Anglican communion globally, all the dioceses, probably five dioceses in the whole world have that type of money where they could just pay a check off, get rid of the bishop. Sadly, they, they should have along to, those dioceses should have gotten rid of the bishops. But, um, I don't know what he's looking for here. There's no, there's no money in Anglicanism, George. Well, uh, I don't know if it's true or whether all this, I don't know if the allegations against him are true or not, mm -hmm. but it is certainly true that an audit was done and after the audit, which has not been published, mm -hmm. after the audit, the bishops uh, asked him to resign. We know that. So let's put two and two together there. Absolutely. But what is not true is that somebody's writing a check this week for a million dollars, or actually it sounds better in the Malawian currency. It's one billion kwacha, which is their currency. He's going to be a billionaire if this happens. Jeez. Oh, uh, you posted a, a funny story. It's not in the show notes here. Um, Welby cuddles up with the uh, gay lobby. What was that? Jul Julian Mann had a uh, nice little piece half tongue-in-cheek, half, uh, half sure. news analysis, where uh, Justin, and this sort of leads into our other Welby story, where Justin Welby basically has decided to uh, uh, hand, uh, hand a, give a leg up to the gay lobby in the Church of England, uh, or to sort of embrace them. But uh, this embrace is, might be, he might catch monkeypox or something, or it's, it's, it's a poisonous <laughs> embrace. In other words, uh, Julian, Julian's point is that though he's cuddling up, it's not going to uh, do him. It's not going to get any favors because the, the, the left still regards Justin Welby, even after all he's done for them at the Lambeth Conference, as the enemy. So it's, uh, it's yeah, a, it's uh, it's one of those interesting stories. I was just looking at the headline, and I thought we could do better. You know, I'm like. Justy, Justin Welby in bed with the gay lobby would have been better than cuddle. But, you know, I was I was not the the headline writer that day, and um, that would have been clickbait, Georgia. We don't do as much clickbait as we should. We should probably be doing a little more. And that does go into our final story. And our final story is about Lambeth 2022. Final but one. Final but one. Oh, you got one? Okay, all right. Well, let's, we'll mm -hmm. cover the Lambeth 2022, yeah. which if you want to sum up Lambeth 2022, it would be peace, peace, where there is no peace, or unity, unity, where there is no unity, um, where the leaders had an objective to reunite the whole church, which is you know completely divided, and then after the conference proclaimed the success of that unity. Even though casual observers, secular observers, church observers 
unscripted observers know that that wasn't achieved at all. And that there was no repentance in this Lambeth, that they were looking to be virtual signalers and they were looking to find a way forward. And that way forward is to find two truths. One is the biblical truth represented by the Global South and Gafgon, where uh, all sexuality should be kept within marriage, within the confines of the fireplace we call marriage. The second truth is the more the Gnostic truth that, well, we need to leave it up to the individual to tell us what they desire and what they lust for. And there's, tr there's the truth. And so we, we live this, this plural church now of Anglicanism. And that's just me summing it up. I got to get back to show notes. Hold on. But when Justin decided there was two truths, it may have been more unscripted than we were being led to believe, George. Yeah. On August 2nd, at the start of the closed plenary on human dignity, Justin Welby gave an unannounced uh, un, uh, statement on his views on the human sexuality issue. And three things were stated in this. One, that the gay point of view was firmly within the Anglican world. They were no longer outsiders. Second, that they had put a great deal of time, energy, and study into this, and it was theologically valid. And third, I, Justin Welby, will not exercise leadership or discipline uh, as Archbishop of Canterbury. This, the reaction from the room was basically euphoria. It, it sort of uh, broke, the, many people were fearful of a showdown on human sexuality. And this sort of popped that bubble. Uh, some people immediately afterwards that day, like Jill Duff, a uh, cons uh, conservative Church of England suffragan bishop, a woman bishop from Lancaster, uh, wrote that uh, this it was almost like a movement of the Holy Spirit, that uh, we all became friends, peace, love, and happiness from that point forward. And what we saw here over the rest of Lambeth was what I call the Stockholm Cinder, where people are locked in a room for long enough, they'll start to uh, take on the uh, uh, cause of their oppressors, and you saw that happen at the Lambeth Conference. What, and I know this is irritating to uh, some of the bishops who watch, but they are not the best people to give an account of what happens because they have their view. Whereas Kevin, you and I have hundreds of views, plus we have the experience of having done this many times before. We've been there before. Fool us once, shame on us. <laughs> Fool us twice. No, the, I've got a, oh, gee, I messed it up. Fool us once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. The, um, well, what we've learned, and this is the sort of George and Kevin special that caused people to watch Anglican Inc., mm -hmm. our sources. People chat with us and talk to us. Um, Kevin had a very good interview with Foley Beach, for example, about Lambeth 2022. Well, I've been talking and nosing around, and I found out that Justin Welby's speech was not pre-planned. In other words, most of Lambeth was planned months and years ago. This is how it's going to unfold. These are the speeches I'm going to give. These are the points I'm going to make. Justin Welby's speech was almost off the cuff, and it was in response to the Global South Anglicans' pressure to have a vote on Lambeth 110. So up through the Monday night when they're arguing, can we have this? And Welby's trying to develop, to uh, prevent it from coming up, finding excuses. Oh, well, we can't do, we can't collect votes anymore because it's only by hands. Oh, we can't do this or that. The Global South did not relent in wanting an up and down vote on Lambeth 110. So this was Welby's last stratagem. And he gave this speech and it worked in the short term. But what's happened since then is that the hangover has passed and the bishops are sobering up. And what they're sobering up to is that for conservatives, both within the Church of England and in the wider Anglican world, they have found that Justin Welby's giveaway, uh, his cuddling of the, of the gay lobby, has meant that the theological fortress 
uh, that of tradition of scripture of reason that they relied upon to defend themselves from those who wish these innovations to be accepted has been breached and it was breached by justin welby who now says that they've worked very hard on this theologically and that they're sincere in this and therefore we need to take it as an equally valid understanding of human sexuality michael curry is no dummy and he immediately said for the first time we ha our point of view is recognized now on one level that's a mistake because we've been talking about the existence of those who hold this view for a long long time but what curry meant was that he heard justin welby say that your position is valid you're no longer the outsider mm -hmm. you hold in other words just as we have anglo catholics and evangelicals who have a different understanding of what takes place at the eucharist and both are equally valid within the anglican sphere the argument over human sexuality according to pope justin is now at that level that we will not say that this is wrong and so conservative bishops in the church of england who are working on this living in love and uh, faith llf project and are basically saying well look here's what tradition tradition says here's what scripture says here's what our reason tells us they have been undermined and they've woken up to the fact that they have been sold out by a foolish man who panicked and gave a speech where he said more than he should have said. Well, he basically said, stop fighting, you're both right. I mean, he, he brought the, the discussion du jour, uh, sexuality uh, with and without the church, to an equal plane. If you believe the uh, biblical uh, teaching, doctrine around marriage and sexuality, you're right. If you believe the Holy Spirit is doing something new within the Anglican Communion and the provinces uh, within Lutheranism, Roman Catholicism, and all the other denominations around the world, uh, that the Holy Spirit's doing something new, you're right. Both can be right in Justin's world. And what he did in his unscripted moment though is present a lie or present um a misrepresentation of the vast theological work that went into finding out the holy spirit is doing something new you and i have been following this you know closely for 20 years uh me in the periphery for 30 years um every time there was a theological challenge to what the holy spirit was doing new um the theological presentment showed that the Holy Spirit was not doing something new, that the Bible clearly represented sex to be within the framework of marriage, uh, that it clearly represented that those who lived outside of, of marriage in, in lives that were dragging them away from relationship with God could be transformed. You and I know people who uh, stop following their lust lived a transformed life and have become post-gay, post-lesbian. I have a couple friends who are post-transgendered um, and are living transformed lives. So that biblical knowledge doctrine that has existed for thousands of years, we do know to be true, not just a doctrine. And Justin has presented this as, as even. Mm -hmm. And you can't. Now, this is wonderful news for Michael Curry and the gay lobby, because they now have been given cover, and that will result in intensified persecution for conservatives within the Episcopal Church, because what do you mean you disagree with us? Justin Welby says this is a valid proposition, and this Our is what we as Episcopalians yeah. think. Well, so Justin Welby has made himself Pope. He doesn't have the authority to do any of this stuff, but he's done it. But it has also given the Global South Fellowship of Anglicans everything they wanted and needed. Mm -hmm. Because they can now point to this as uh, to those wavering bishops in the West saying, you need us more than we need you at this stage. If you want to stand for what you believe to be true and your institution is suffering this rot, you can't trust Justin Welby. You can't trust you know, the words of Michael Curry and things like that. You must uh, follow us. Mm -hmm. So it's a good news for the Global South Anglicans. It is. In fact, GAFCON Australia is meeting, 
And I, we forgot to add to our show notes, the press release. What's happening down there, George? Well, they, uh, you, you'll probably do a longer in-depth with uh, David Old once it's all over with. But at the first day, the Global South Anglicans are meeting in, in uh, I'm sorry, GAFCON Australia, mm -hmm. are meeting in Canberra, Australia. And there are 350 delegates, deputies from Australia, New Zealand, New Guinea, uh, the Vanuatu and uh, Micronesia. And they're gathering to sort of respond to the state of the Anglican affairs in Australia. And it was announced that there will be a Diocese of the Southern Cross, a non-geographic Anglican diocese, and uh, Glenn Davies, the former Archbishop of Sydney, will be the new, uh, be the bishop of that diocese. And they already have their first parish, an Anglican parish uh, from the suburbs of Brisbane, the Diocese of uh, uh, South Queensland. So um, Foley Beach is there right now, and uh, um, he's participating in this, uh, um, but it's unfolding as we speak. Yeah, so we'll, we'll definitely have more news hopefully by the end of the week. Uh, I've been hinted at by some people that there's an even more major announcement. They may be people who have not read Anglican Inc. and found the announcements already. We'll have, to, we'll have to see if this is a bigger announcement, but we shall see. Any other news? I went through the, the list of nine here. I think we got them I, all. Yeah, your, your, your interview with uh, Foley Beach. Um, That's news? Okay. Well, any that's news. I mean, it'll be news to... Uh, <laughs> yes, if you didn't see it yet, I, my last uh, Anglican Unscripted number 753 is an interview I did with Archbishop Foley Beach uh, post-Lambeth, and he had a lot to talk about, uh, you know, in, special, in response to the, the two plural worlds Justin put forward, um, the utter disdain Lambeth had for the Global South and uh, specifically <laughs> accusing the Global South of being puppets of GAFCON. Uh, he, he, he got a big kick out of that. So, uh, yeah, it was, it was a big interview, George. Do you have any questions you, you, I didn't ask? No, I, I basically am trying to give a hook so that people go watch it. And oh, uh... God, yeah. In the show notes right here, click the link that says interview with Archbishop Foley Beach. Well, thank you, George. I appreciate that in, insider uh, uh, advertisement. In fact, we should probably start donations now so that you and I can go to Kigali. I'm going to put another link down there in our show notes. And I, people asked, what were our show notes? Uh, somebody asked how to get to the show notes. You basically, no, that's not the show notes. Uh, you go to YouTube. I'll bring it up here of uh, Kevin and George. This is unscripted here. And if you go down, if you're watching this on YouTube, and you go and, and scroll down, you're going to find show notes. And so you just scroll down and here are our show notes. You click show more and all these links appear. Uh, if you want to be friends with us on Facebook, it shows you how to do that. Uh, any other links that are vital to the show are here. And this is where I post any uh, good links that we talk about during the show. So there. I've answered a question from a viewer on Anglican Unscripted. I'm Kevin Carlson. And I'm George Congan. You've been watching episode 754 of Anglican Unscripted.